Jesus, thank you, God, for calling us to be here. I ask you to change lives this morning. I ask you to take doubt away. I ask you to confirm to people the supreme and breathtaking logic of your salvation and your redemption. Take away doubts. Take away fears. We ask you to change and alter the way Satan is able and now unable to attack people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, everybody needs to have a Bible with you this morning. If you don't have one, if you didn't bring one with you, please turn around and uh, have Jojo or one of the uh, guys give you. We are down all our deacons today, by the way. Um, so everybody needs to kind of help out. Uh, Kalai is at home taking care of uh, uh, Lizzie. She's very ill, and uh, I don't know where Koi is, and Leanne is uh, feeding. So anyway, we have, yeah. But anyway, everybody make sure you have a Bible, and I want you to turn with me to 1 John chapter 3. It's near the very end. 1 John 3. More and more, this church is being blessed with people who are very, very introspective, meditative, contemplative people. In the old days, when I first started preaching, uh, people's attitude about the gospel was a little bit different, and seemingly, whatever I said, people just gobbled up. Lately, it seems as though, with the advent of cable news and just the way people's minds are being trained, we think differently, and we think more critically. And a certain aspect of salvation is becoming harder and harder for people to wrap their arms around. I actually talked to a minister last week who did not know how to reconcile this question. And that is, if you are already forgiven for your sins, if because of Jesus' death on the cross and your faith in that, you've been forgiven. How many know they've been forgiven? Say amen. amen. Why does the New Testament say you have to repent of your sins? Why does the New Testament say, can somebody help her? I know Nani is not here today. Oh, I know, but she tells Nani that too, and she nearly falls. Um, but uh, 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 we're forgiven for our sins. So the question comes up, if that's true, why do we need to confess our sins? Why do we have to deal with sins? Why does the New Testament say we have to examine our lives, and when we do something wrong, repent if we're already forgiven? It seems a dichotomy. Either you're forgiven or not. Okay? Uh, it, it's like when you have an argument with somebody, a lot of times it's like, well, I totally forgive you. I absolutely forgive you, but I don't trust you anymore. Well, guess what? You're not forgiven. Exactly right. If, you have to, if, if you're still being asked by somebody to do something uh, uh, to reconcile the issue, you haven't really forgiven yet. So here's the backlash to that question. Has, does God really forgive or not? If he's really forgiven your sins, why is he asking you to confess them? Why is he asking you to sustain them? I mean, technically, if, if you are forgiven for every sin, William, should you not be able to just live however you want in this constant perpetual state of no matter what I do, I'm automatically forgiven for it. So if I'm automatically forgiven for it because everything I do is covered by the blood of Jesus, why should I give a rip what I do? And why should God give a rip what I do? Yet, certain parts of his word says I'm supposed to confess my sins and change my life. The two are a dichotomy. They don't make sense. They don't reconcile. I was actually talking to somebody in evangelism ministry who doesn't know the answer to this, what he, he thinks is a riddle, and which is actually a demonstration, possibly the greatest demonstration, of God's mercy and grace and love extended in man. Let me explain it to you this morning. 1 John chapter 3, and I want you to read this carefully. Okay? It says... You know that he, that's Jesus, appeared in order to take away sins. How many say amen? And in him there is no sin. How many say amen? Read on. No one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has seen him or knows him. Little children, make sure no one deceives you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he, Jesus, is righteous. The one who practices sin is of the devil. This is New Testament, one of the last books to have been written in the New Testament. 
The one who practices sin is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The Son of God appeared for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. No one who is born of God practices sin. No one who is born of God practices sin. Because his seed abides in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. So if you're born of God, you do not practice sin. You don't do it. You don't sin. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9, and you don't have to turn there, but you listen to these words carefully, says this, Or do you not know the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor the effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. If you practice these things, says the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, seemingly, when you read these passages, you are locked into a theological conclusion that stipulates you may say you're saved, you may say you're redeemed, you may say you know God, but if you continue to practice sin, you actually do not. You are one of the unrighteous, and although you claim to know Jesus, and although you claim to love Jesus, if you continue to practice sin of any sort, and there's a litany in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 of what you should and should not do, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. You will essentially go to hell. Your eternal future is in hell. Now, see, amen. She agrees, see, and listen, listen to Grandma. Now, where's the balance to all this? In 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, it says this, My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone sins, say that with me, but if anyone sins, one more time, <laughs> but if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ, the righteous, and he himself is the propitiation, that is the payment for the violation, the penalty that you owe for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the whole world. He offers that as an option for everybody. Now, if you've ever been arrested, one of the things you'll hear when your Miranda rights are, written, are read to you is this, that you have the right to counsel. That you have the right to not talk to anybody, not talk and not sit, sit there under questioning, unless you have an advocate, unless you have a defense attorney, unless you have somebody who understands the law fully and will speak for you. And according to your Miranda rights, you do not have to speak to anybody or talk to anybody until your advocate comes. Well, you have an advocate in heaven any time you sin, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, where we're reading, it says, none of these people will inherit the kingdom of God. But the very next verse in chapter 11 says this, and remember, we talked about fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, the effeminate, homosexuals, nor thieves. Effeminate, effeminate means men who act like women. In God's natural order, men are supposed to act like men. Women are supposed to act like women. There are stipulations in Scripture as to what God wants, and he considers that to be a violation. He considers that to be a sin is when a man tries to act like a woman. That's what that word effeminate means homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, revilers, or swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Verse 11, and such were some of you. But you were washed. But you were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ in the spirit of our God. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are profitable. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. Now here's where Paul starts to get quizzical. And you start scratching your head going, okay, I, I get it, there's a balance. I'm a believer but I'm not supposed to sin. If I do sin, I have a defense attorney. If I have a defense attorney who has already paid for my sins and everything's already been paid for, how do, we, how do you reconcile this entire thing? Okay. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, it tells us something fascinating. Man is, and let's just talk about, here's you. 
Okay, you. You are comprised of three things. What is it? Your three things. Body, soul, and spirit. Body, soul, and spirit. Right? That's you. Somebody tell me what the soul is comprised of. Two essential elements. The mind contains the intellect and the heart contains emotions. This is where your awareness is. This is who, the, this is who, and who you are. And the who of who you are, your existence, is housed within a physical body right now. Where's the spirit? Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, where I was just talking about, says this. For the word of God is living and active and sharper than a two-edged sword, and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit. The what? The division of soul and spirit. Say that with me. Division of soul and spirit. For some reason, and most theologians believe it happened in the garden in Genesis chapter 3 when Adam and Eve sinned, and suddenly there was this change. Suddenly they felt they were naked. Suddenly they felt like they were unprotected. Suddenly it felt like to them they were exposed to dangers that they had not been exposed to before. Here's what most theologians believe. It's at that time that this dividing asunder, that's how the King, the King James Bible calls it, This division or dividing asunder between soul and spirit happened. And here's the thing. The Bible talks about there being two kinds of bodies. A physical body and a spirit body. Now when Adam was first created, he was a combination of all three things. He was triune. Follow me so far? He was three in one. Now, remember where it says in Genesis chapter 1 and 2, man was made in God's image? Well, in what way is man made in God's image? I mean, you look at Matt, you would think that God is Filipino, right? Or you look at, you know, uh, 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 Daryl, and you think he's pure Hawaiian. By the way, do you know that he's 100% pure Hawaiian? There are very, very few left. He's one of the last. But if you look at yourself, you think God is like this? I was made in God's image? What must, what, what must God look like? Well, God doesn't resemble you physically. It doesn't matter if you're male or female. It doesn't matter what race you are. It doesn't matter how tall or fat you are. What matters is this. God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's three in one, right? So is Adam. Spirit, soul, and body. It is in this way that you are made in the image of God. You are also triune. You are also three in one. There's a spirit body. There's a physical body and the soul was housed in a combination of spirit body, soul body, um, uh, spirit body, physical body, the soul was in it. So when Adam was walking around in the garden, with your physical body you have five senses. What are they? Sight, hearing, feel, taste, smell, right? You have all five senses. The spirit body also have, has senses. Your spirit body enables you to see things that are spiritual, feel things that are spiritual, hear things that are spiritual. There are angels all around you, yes or no? Can you hear them? Can you see them? Why not? Because there's a dividing asunder, a separation, a division between your soul and your spirit body. And now you can no longer perceive things in the spirit. Imagine if you were Adam in the garden seeing all these spiritual things and being aware of all these spiritual things and suddenly because you bite into this fruit offered to you by your wife Eve, boom, there's a divining of center and all of a sudden all that imagery and all that awareness cut out. And there are more spiritual things, by the way, in existence than there are physical. So the world suddenly for Adam and Eve became very different. And they could no longer protect themselves, they could no longer see themselves, and so they were naked, exposed, and afraid. So you have a spirit, you have a soul, and you have a body. And these are divided asunder. Let's talk about your spirit. In the Bible, if you look in Hebrews chapter 12, you'll see that the spirit, body, there is actually a Greek word for it, pneumatikos, in, in, um, in Greek it looks like that, literally means spirit, body, or spirit f form. Well, what condition is your spirit? 
Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22 says this, But you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to the myriads of angels, to the general assembly of the church of the firstborn, who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect. Are they being made perfect? Are they going to be made perfect? What does Scripture say? Made perfect. And to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant and the sprinkled blood, which speaks better than the blood of Abel. So, according to the Bible, Lisa, because you believe in Jesus, you believe in Jesus, right? Lord and Savior. Okay, because of that, your spirit has been already made perfect. Absolutely perfected. Done deal. Your spirit is made perfect. To the spirits of the righteous, made perfect. Perfect. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6 says something really weird. You want to hear it? It says, And God raised us up with Christ, raised, raised, and seated us with him in the heavenly realms. Seated, seated. You have, when you accepted Jesus, you have been raised up in Christ and seated with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. In order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Show grace, kindness. Show grace, kindness. Say that with me. Show grace, kindness. What did God do this for? He wanted to show his grace and his kindness by seating us and raising us up to be seated with Christ in heaven already. Well, I put it to you. Use your logic for just a second. You don't even have to be a theologian. You just have to be intelligent. You are seated right now with Jesus Christ. That's what the Bible says. When you came to accept the Lord, you were raised and you were seated with Christ in order that God might show his grace and his kindness. Well, since I see you here and you were just playing on worship team and mentally you're here. I don't know if you're mentally here when Matt's telling his joke, but now I'm preaching to you, so mentally you're here, right? What part of you is not here. You're seated with Christ. Right? That's what the Bible says. You were raised and you were seated with him. It's a done deal. It happened already. So if Kate is here, I see her head right here, and I know that she, her consciousness and her existence is here, what part of Kate is seated with Christ now? Which has been divided asunder, by the way. And if, he seated, if you're seated with Christ in heaven, you wouldn't know it anyway. Because there's no discourse between spirit and soul right now. When you want to perceive things, your soul wants to perceive things in the spirit. You can't rely on your own spirit. Whose spirit do you rely on to perceive things in the spirit? The Holy Spirit who is in you. Right? That's why your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. So you can now perceive things in the Spirit by having a relationship with the Holy Spirit. But your spirit, man, your pneumaticos, gone, separate. But it is this that has already been made perfect. Your body, by the way, has no chance. 1 Corinthians 15, 49 and 50 says, Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. We all bear the likeness of the man from earth. That's Adam. And flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. So your body, lost. There's nothing you can do about it. You can exercise. You can eat right. You can wear that kind of um, you know, mask when you walk around like they do in Japan. But in the end, something's going to get you. In the end, something's going to get you. Don Godwin's uh, grandfather just passed away at 103. And that's a long time until you're 102. And then 103 doesn't sound very old to you. Okay? In the end, something's going to get you. Some of you will die younger than others. Some of you will live to have a longer life. But in the end, it will not seem all that long. Because there is nothing you can do to redeem your physical body. That is corrupt, and there's not a spiritual thing you can do to change that. In the end, everybody is going to die once. That's what the Bible says. 
So this is corrupted, and that's gone. So what you have held in the middle is this perfect spirit body, this totally corrupted and in unredeemable physical body under our present spiritual terms, and a soul that's caught in the middle. A soul that is caught in the middle. And here's the thing. It is that soul that God wants to deal with. James chapter 4, verse 8. Anybody know what that says? James 4, 8. Draw near to me and I will draw near to you. Draw near to me and I will draw near to you. God wants our soul, that's our mind and our heart, to come close to him. Now once you accept Jesus Christ, your spirit is already made perfect. This determines whether you go to heaven or hell. This determines salvation. Let me write that down in a different color. Salvation. You are already saved because your spirit has already been made perfect. Your body, that's lost. That's going to die and that's going to stay on earth. It's your soul. And this soul, your mind and your heart, has to do with something else. Salvation is already perfect. You, you, already, you already have that part. Jesus did that part for you. So you're saved. But your soul, that's different. How many can say your soul is pure? The way you think, pure. Pure thoughts, all the time. Pure feelings, all the time. I never get angry. I never get sad. I'm never afraid of anything. I only have good thoughts all the time. I never think anything inappropriate. I never think anything destructive. I never think anything mean. Perfect soul. Perfect mind, perfect heart, eh, doesn't happen. That's the part that God says, when this part of you sins, I want you to confess it before me. I want you to work on it. I want you to continue to refine it and draw closer to me. The whole point is drawing closer. Listen to this. Because everybody says the same thing. James 4, 8 says, come near to me, draw near to me, and I will draw near to you. That's only half of the verse. The other half says, wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Washing your hands has to do with not practicing sin, and purifying your hearts has to do with purging all this gunk that's in there. How do you draw near to God? Kate, how do you draw near to God? See, because here's the thing. Everybody thinks you draw near to God by all this. Rashi Mohandai stuff, and it doesn't matter how much you hate your mother, and it doesn't matter how much you want your brother dead, and it doesn't matter how much you want to do something inappropriate with this guy or this girl. None of that matters. All that matters is if I really close my eyes and during praise, you know, that's drawing close to God. Well, according to this, drawing close to God means washing your hands and purifying your heart. That's how you draw close to God. You don't draw close to God by singing this song. You draw close to God by changing your hearts and changing your life so you no longer do the things that the Word of God says are sin and separate you from Him. Can I hear an amen? See, that's what drawing near means, and that's what He wants us to deal with here. So when He talks about confessing sin and dealing with sin and refraining from sin, it is not to secure salvation. It is to secure relationship, fellowship, with God, the Holy Spirit. That's what that's for. And that's why we have this dichotomy, because you are not purely a spirit being, you are also a soul being, and you're also a physical being, which God isn't going to do anything about right now, but in the end it's going to be completely cleansed. See, here's what 1 John chapter 1, verse 8 says. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. How many would say amen to that? Anybody who says, oh, I don't sin anymore. I, I don't have any sin in me. Well, yeah, I, I actually had a guy. It was not this last ha Halloween, but the Halloween before, who came to me and said, rather wild-eyed, I don't sin anymore, you know. I said, really? He goes, yeah, I haven't committed a sin in three years. I said, you realize you're sinning right now? <laughs> huh? And I showed him this. I said, if you claim to be without sin, you're deceiving yourself and the truth is not in you. So you're guilty of the sin of lying. Hearing this line. I never saw that before. I'm like, well, now you have something new to think about. Um, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. And again, it states it again in verse 10. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word has no place in our lives. 
So to draw near to God, we need to purify our hearts and wash our hands, change our lives, and stop sinning and completely allow God to transmogrify all these icky thoughts and all these feelings that we have. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13, which we talked about last week, says, We ought to always thank God for you, brothers, loved by the Lord, because from the beginning God chose you to be saved through the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit. So it's the Holy Spirit working in you that's going to change you and transform you. But it is this that needs transformation, your mind and your heart. Spiritually, you are still perfect. So, with that in mind, Perry, is it okay for Scripture to say, you have been made perfect, you have been forgiven, and you are flawless already? Is that accurate? Yes, regarding your spirit. You still need to learn, you still need to grow, you still need to pray, you still need to confess your sins, and you still need to change your life. Is that also accurate? Yes, in terms of your soul because you are spirit, soul, and body. And God knows this, and so he has to address all these things. For instance, a man can be a perfect worker. You can be a construction worker, for instance, okay? And, 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 and you can be absolutely perfect in everything you do. Chris here, he's a general contractor. He works with, you know, uh, uh, people who pound nails all the time. And there are some guys who, you know, really need to go back to trade school. There are others that, you, know, you swear to God, you know, they could pound in a nail straight by blowing on it because they're so good at it. But they go home, they're terrible fathers. They go home, they abuse their wife. They go to church and they don't really believe. They may be great as carpenters, but reek in this other area. So you would say to them, so do I need to improve my skills as a carpenter? Well, no. When I say you need to change and you need to improve, I don't mean you need to change. He's very interested in all this, aren't you? Yes, you are. Um, when I say you need to improve, I don't mean you need to improve your skills as a carpenter. What I'm saying is you need to improve your skills as a husband and as, as a father. You need to cha cha change all this. God sees, just as every single one of us are, are many different people. I am a husband. I am a father. I am a pastor, I'm a businessman. And all four of those function very, very differently. Yet yeah, it's the same Wendell. So too it's true of you. And God has citations throughout Scripture for every single one of those things. So there is no dichotomy in Scripture. Actually, what you're reading is this. What you're seeing is a God who understands how corrupted you are. A God who understands how evil and how dark your mind and your heart can be, but because you have faith in Jesus, has still saved and purified you spiritually to the point where He has raised you up and seated you with Christ in heavenly places to demonstrate and show His grace and mercy. Somebody say amen. And so there's not only no dichotomy, and, and you know, what I told this evangelist is, you can preach and say you need to you repent of your sins. You can preach. In fact, you should strongly, stringently tell people all these things that you see in 1 Corinthians 6, you need to stop doing because that causes you to draw near to God. That increases your relationship and fellowship with Him, and that's where blessing and anointing and protection and fellowship with the Lord come from. That's where peace in your mind and peace in your heart come from. You will not have those things if you refuse to draw near to Him. You're screwing up in your area. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12, He has to discipline you like a father. Don't sit there and scratch your butt and wonder why life is not going perfect and where is God and where is His blessing if you continue to walk in a life that just says, you know, forget you. I know what your word says. I don't care. I'm going to sin anyway. Because this suits me and this makes sense for me right now. This gives me what I want. So I'm going to keep doing it. Well, it doesn't affect this at all. All things are legal, lawful, but not all things are beneficial. It doesn't hurt you spiritually. You still have your salvation. You will still go to heaven if you die. But now your relationship with God and your fellowship with the Holy Spirit and the blessing He's able to do and, and the way He's able to, to, to move in your life is severely limited. And if what you're doing draws in and affects other people, now you're being deleterious to them as well. God knows that, so he wants you to stop doing this. So, for us as Christians, here's the balance, and then I'll, uh, and then I'll stop, because I want to ride. Here's the balance. 
Realizing what God has done for you spiritually as a result of you believing in Jesus takes your breath away with how merciful and gracious he is. How can he totally redeem us, forgive us, and save us, save us from everything we've ever done, are doing, and shall do? Simply because we believe his son Jesus is Lord and Savior and he died on the cross and rose again. That to me is so cheap. It's cheap. It's easy. And that's what I told this evangelist. Salvation is a simple process. God made it a simple process. However, sanctification, not so much. Sanctification is something that the Bible says we're supposed to work out, we just read it, with fear and trembling. This is going to be hard, difficult stuff. This will require discipleship. This will require learning. This will require fellowship, not only with God, but with other believers. This will require application of your heart and mind to the point where Paul says, I beat my own body until it submits to what the Word of God says. Why? Not because you're afraid you're going to lose your salvation, but because you want to draw near to God, and you want to be pleasing to Him. How many say amen to that? And it all comes down to this. When you're drawn and torn apart by what you want and what God wants, somebody's going to be happy and somebody's going to be sad. Who, who is it going to be? Who's going to be disappointed in your life? God or you? You choose. But here's the wonder of it all. You still are saved either way because spiritually you've been made perfect. So when we preach to people, whether we talk to other believers or whether we talk to people who have not accepted Jesus yet, we have to provide for them a balance between God's grace and God's love and God's justice. Right? Here's the thing. Bible says, mercy triumphs over justice. He is more merciful than he is legal. With every head bowed and every eye closed, let me pray for you. How many are glad you came this morning? Say amen. amen. I never want you to struggle with anybody throwing out scriptures that seem to castigate and condemn you. Because you are uncondemnable. Romans chapter 8 verse 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Okay? Your sins cannot cast you into hell anymore because the blood of Christ covers you spiritually. But it does separate you from God still in terms of relationship. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray for every single person in this room. And we don't want to be separated from you anymore. We don't want to be divided from you anymore. Lord, there are things in my life that take me apart from you and separate me from you. I don't want to do that anymore. So in Jesus' name, Lord, I want to change all that. I repent, God, of my sins. I ask you to forgive me. I see that they're sinful. I see that they're wrong. I know that they're not supposed to be here. And I ask you, Lord, to cleanse me and my life of these things that are rebellion against you. And I want to thank you now, Lord. Just take a minute to thank him for his salvation and his grace. Thank Him. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for being so merciful to me. You are merciful to me, my God. Be blessed this week. I look forward to seeing you either on Tuesday night for prayer or Wednesday night for Bible study. Next week, Dave Rua. Somebody say hallelujah. All right, thanks for coming this morning. See you later.